spooky, it's too weird. We want to do nice, hard-nosed, sensible, analytic philosophy. Um, but if, just to close on a personal note, I, I don't myself see any reason why that final step to God should be resisted. In fact, I think there may be every reason not to resist it. Now, just very quickly to wind up, you often hear philosophers rejecting any reference to God in morals because of what's called the euthyphro problem. I've mentioned, have I mentioned it? Yes, this is eight. Um, just mentioned it there. It's named after a platonic dialogue. Um, but without going into the, the, that particular work of Plato, um, just it's a shorthand for the view, God's commands can't make something right or wrong just in themselves. Just the fact that God orders you to do something can't make it right. After all, if he ordered you to be cruel, or to, that wouldn't make something right. Um, just because he's strong and powerful, that can't make it right to do what he says. That wouldn't be morality. That would be tyranny. So it can't just be God's commands that make something right. Um, but I think the theist wants to say, no, it's not just the commands of a powerful creator, it's the commands of a good and loving creator. Um, after all, the God in the Hebrew Bible is a God of loving kindness. The God in Islam in the Quran is the God who is all compassionate, all merciful. And the Christian God, of course, maybe these are the same God, all these three, uh, is identified with love in the fourth gospel. So the God of the three great Abrahamic faiths is not just an arbitrary tyrant who issues instructions, but when properly understood is a God of goodness and love. Um, so ethics, if grounded in such a being, is grounded in the way things are. And it actually, and this connects with what Keith Ward was saying, perhaps, uh, um, if the theistic view is right, then reality is ultimately personal. The ultimate reality is somehow conscious and personal, and it's also rational. And maybe that fits. Uh, I mean, the two great features of God in the Christian tradition are logos and agape, reason and love, rationality and love. And so the cosmos on that showing is the kind of cosmos where we might expect objective rationality and morality. Um, it kind of fits. Um, now, of course, all, to say I've got a theistic version of ethics or, or a religious grounding for ethics only works if, if religion is true, if there really is a God, and I haven't discussed that question today. Um, and I don't myself think we could ever establish that by scientific inquiry. Um, but if it's true, I mean, it does provide a framework, a kind of framework that frees us from a flux of contingency and evolutionary um, happenstance, accident, and gives us a stable, objective, universal, normative grounding for morality. In a random, impersonal universe, a purely contingent universe that happens to have developed a certain way, I don't see why there would be any conclusive reason not to oppress the helpless, or whether there'd be any conclusive reason to forgive someone who is sincerely sorry for having wronged you. If you believe in conclusive authoritative reasons of that kind, if you believe in this queer nature of morality that exerts this authoritative power over us, then theism provides a home for that view. If God himself is in his essential nature merciful, compassionate, just, and loving, then when humans act in these ways, we're drawn closer to God, the source of our being, the source of all that is good. And so we're drawn closer to the source where our true peace and fulfillment lies. Uh, believing that may, of course, be partly a matter of faith. But if my argument today has been anywhere near right, 
it may also reflect a philosophically more satisfying account of morality than anything else currently on offer. So, thank you very much. And we'll have time for some questions. bit of time for some questions, so do, um, do feel free to raise, raise any, any issues. Yeah. Yes, thanks very much. That's a, that's a very apt question. Um, well, it, it, it hinges on this word brute, I think. I mean, ever since Hume in the 18th century, um, the, the general view has been that truths about existence, truths about the world generally, are contingent. You know, they happen to be this way, but they might have been other. So if I drop this, it happens to fall, but maybe in another universe where the weak forces and the strong force are a bit different, it wouldn't have to. Um, so brute facts just happen to be that way. Now, mathematics doesn't seem to be like that. Logic and mathematics have, as I said, this feature of necessity. It seems they've got to be that way. So this sort of contingent universe, one thing after another, that just evolves a certain way, somehow has room for mathematical truths that have got to be that way. They have a necessity which seems more than just brute happening to, your sugar happens to dissolve in water. It's not quite like that. And similarly in ethics, if, I, if what I was saying was right, that these truths have to be, cruelty really has to be wrong. It's wrong in itself. So you could just say, well, that's the end of it. I, that's all we can say. And I suppose you're right in a way. All explanations got to stop somewhere. But most of the things we say are true have some sort of grounding. They're grounded in the way things are. So I'm not myself comfortable in having these truths just being there without any truth maker to make them true. And God, in a way, is the sort of ultimate truth maker. So that's the way I'd sort of go with that. Yeah. Mm. Does that mean, uh, from what you said, as God is a truth maker, that you feel comfortable with the idea of divine command theory, that goodness and God commanding it, uh, it's identical and simultaneous, that there isn't the idea of an arbitrary choice at all? Right, yes, th thank you very much. The, 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 this is this, a question about so-called divine command theory, which says that goodness is identical, or maybe rightness is identical with what's commanded by God. Um, as I said just at the end, connected with the euthyphro thing, uh, problem, so-called, I don't think it can be right that, at least not just the fact of being commanded, Otherwise, we'd have to say, if God commanded us to torture babies, that would make it right. But it obviously wouldn't. Uh, his commands would be wrong. And so it seems that just, just being ordered, I was only obeying order, you know, it just being ordered can't be the feature, the good-making feature. Um, I suppose the theist view is that God is the source of goodness, so goodness somehow flows from the nature of the creator who is himself good. Uh, it doesn't really explain goodness away, but it's somewhat like Plato, if anyone's looked at Plato's theory of forms, Plato believes that good things owe their goodness to sort of coming from the source of goodness, the form of the good. 
So God, in a way, functions a bit like that platonic form. He's the ultimate source of goodness, who is himself good. So ultimate reality on this view is itself a kind of rational, moral being. And morality comes from that. So the short answer is it's not just because it's ordered. The long answer is that um, the nature of ultimate reality is such that um, it is in itself good and just and righteous, and therefore if we want to draw closer to it, we have to orient ourselves towards that reality. And the, the religious path has always traditionally been thought of as a, as a way of orienting oneself towards these ultimate values. Then look entirely convinced, but perhaps we can come back to that in discussion afterwards. Do you just want to come back on that? Or? Uh, no, it's just yeah. something you said. I was thinking about something that Augustine synthesized with Plato. Yes. It is, I mean, the line I'm taking is broadly a Platonic Augustinian line. Um, uh, and uh, Augustine was drawn to Platonism and then made a final step to, to theism. It's just yeah. because he was a Manichaean. Yes, yes, he had quite an interesting trajectory. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do uh, you reject completely the idea that morality can be like mathematics, can be to some degree tautological, where love leads to less contradiction than its opposite, and it can stand independently in that sense, um, like mathematics stands right. independently from. The yeah, that's that that that's interesting. Um, there is a view of mathematics that it is ultimately just tautologies. That's to say, a equals a. Um, so, a truth like say two plus two equals four. If you unpack the symbols, two is one plus one plus 1 plus 1 equals 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1. So it's just an elaborate way of saying A equals A. Um, moral truths don't seem quite like that because denying them isn't contradictory. So they don't seem to be analytic, to use that jargon well. You don't seem to get, get at them just by unpacking the meanings of the terms. And if, I mean, consider compassion is good. Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche in the 19th century famously, well not famously, said that uh, we ought to steel ourselves against compassion. That compassion was actually bad. Really scary passage actually in that, but uh, that's what he says in, in um, Beyond Good and Evil, or is it in the Genealogy of Morals? One of, one of the two. Um, so, you know, the, the man of the future ought to steel themselves against these weak Christian virtues like compassion. Well, it's pretty scary, as I said, but it's not contradictory. He doesn't seem to be contradicting himself. So I don't think we can explain morality away just as tautological. It seems to have a substantive uh, assertive power to it. Would you agree yeah. that without the, the transcendental, without the appeal to the universe, we can't really have these claims to a moral truth? We're, that we're left with a kind of Nietzschean will to power, hence yeah. torture, hence yes. anchors, hence. Yeah. Yes, you see, uh, I, I rather agree with that. I think that the subjectivists who just say, oh, it's just either your personal preference or it's a projection of your own inclinations or the way. I disagree with them, but I think at least they've got the courage of their convictions. Essentially, they're deflating morality. They're saying, really, morality, we think of it as this a wonderful objective structure, but really, no, it's just you're, you're just coloring it in yourself. Um, now, that subjectivist view um, at least is consistent, I think. What I don't get, and this is sort of autobiographical, maybe I'm just being dense here, but what I don't get is the way that so many philosophers now have abandoned that and they're moved towards an objectivism about ethics. So they're pretty hard card-carrying ethical objectivists, but they don't have the theistic backing uh, for it. 
So they, they think it can be done without the metaphysics, if you like. Certainly, that's Parfit's view, as I was referring to at the end, ethics without ontology. Um, but yes, nothing I've said would refute a, um, a deflationary view of morality that's just a sham, just an illusion, just a matter of personal inclination. Though I do think it's actually very hard to hold that consistently. I think when we contemplate things like compassion, the goodness, as it were, shines out and resonates with us. If we're really being honest, with integrity, I think it's very hard to deny um, that these values are more than just the way I happen to feel, like a taste for strawberries or for oysters or something. So I think the phenomenology, this is a different argument from what I made today, I think that's to say the way it feels like when you contemplate these values uh, seems to support the idea that there's something there which constrains me in spite of myself. Rather like what you feel when contemplating a fantastically beautiful object in nature or an overwhelmingly moving work of art. It seems to be something there which is drawing you forward, not just a personal, oh, I happen to like it, you know. Of course you do happen to like it, but there seems to be something in it that's drawing you forward to admire, to, to respect it, to, and I, I think moral values are like that if we're honest, we're hard put to it to deny that normative power they have. 